What are some of the biggest, stupidest mistakes you can make when starting a glamping business? If you own land or about to purchase a tent, yurt, dome, or tiny home to put on Airbnb, today's episode is for you. My guest started a glamp site last year with just two tents he bought off Amazon. I spoke with him just six weeks after he launched and he told us exactly how he did it and how things were going. Well, now a year later, as he prepares to expand his site to four tents and two tiny cabins, we're gonna talk about the not so glamorous side to glamorous camping. We're talking about dealing with crappy guests, mistakes made on Airbnb listings, what he would do differently if he was just starting his glamping business today, and even having two guests show up for the same tent at the same time. So basically, um... I went the untraditional route. I, I don't own a bunch of land. I set up my sites in a partnership with the landowner. So I basically, I, I started very small with a very basic setup. Uh, the, the property that it's on is about two and a half hours away from where I actually live. Um, and we started with, with one site and we worked out a deal with the, um, with the landowner. We've since kind of expanded from there. We set up our second site soon after, after we kind of hit some goals. Here we are now, you know, this, this all started last year. So I only have about one year experience and uh, six or seven months of actually running the, uh, the sites on, on Airbnb and never, never did anything like this, never uh, rented out anything on, Air, on Airbnb. We've since expanded. And as of this year, in about a month or two, uh, we will be opening our six site uh, glamp ground. You know, mm-hmm. so we'll have one property. It's about 10 acres, and uh, it's going to have uh, four yurt-style bell tents and two tiny cabins. It, uh, what I love about what you have going on is that, you know, you didn't really have a lot of experience on it. Um, I remember from a previous conversation we had, you kind of almost even just started hearing about glamping. Like You didn't even know what it was. Then you started doing a ton of research, and you said, you know what? Screw it. I, I, I think I can get it done. I think I, I want to try that. And I love how you kind of weren't afraid to try something new. Right, yeah. I mean... At first, you know, I was looking into, I saw these, the, the tiny homes, um, and that's what kind of got me interested and started to do more research uh, in this whole, the whole glamping experience. Uh, and then just doing more and more research, I saw that, you know, people were actually renting out these beautiful uh, canvas tents. So, uh, you know, a tiny home could be very expensive, mm-hmm. uh, setting up one of these, these tent sites. Uh, the way I did it was sort of just very basic and it was uh, just you know, a couple thousand, a couple thousand dollars and to get us going. You nice. know? So um, I thought that it was worth the risk and I saw what other people were, were making and what they were renting out at the nightly rate that they were getting. Uh, so I just went, I, I went for it, you know, and nice. it's been very successful. Yeah, I was going to say that you, you kind of went for it. You've uh, had one season going, um, things really worked out for you. Um, but let's be honest, uh, you and I both know in the reality to all of this, I think on YouTube, we kind of only steer towards, you know, the sunshine and the sunshine and rainbows. And it really just isn't that way at all times. So what I'd love to do in this conversation is dig into some of the regrets, the mistakes, you know, the times that we fell flat on our faces and, you know, had to pick ourselves up and, and, and keep going forward. So uh, thank you again for, you know, being okay with us talking about that. So I asked, can you let me know um, what were some of the mistakes that you made, especially early on, that you wish you would have done differently? Uh, you're absolutely right. We, we only see the good side of, of things and everybody talks about, you know, they're making millions of dollars and, and, and they, they fail to show you the struggle and the pain and, and the mistakes that they've made. So, uh, you know, I got, I have a list of mistakes that you can probably make two videos out of, <laughs> you know, we just incredible mistakes. Um, and, uh, without mistakes, you know, there's really no growth. So I, I respect all the mistakes and I'm happy that they had, that, that they happened, you know, cause I, I learned so much from, uh, just all the mistakes that I made. Um, so yeah, some of the, if you want to get right into it, you know, some of the yeah. mistakes, um, so I, like I said, it was a very basic, um, York style bell tent that, that I had set up. So going through when I was doing all the furnishings and purchasing everything for it, um, you know, keep it as, as low of a cost as possible. So some of the, some of the stuff that I bought, I thought it was a really good deal. The pictures look great on Amazon. 
Uh, but when I actually, the product actually got delivered, putting it together, right away I realized that uh, this is not going to last. <laughs> this is not going to last. That's the thing together. Purchase? Right, right. Things like uh, tables and chairs and, and, and things like that. Um, putting them together, you hear the cheap uh, pine wood cracking and, you know, it's, they're smaller than they than they looked in the pictures. Uh, so that would probably be the first thing, you know, purchase quality stuff, invest a little bit more money and, into things that are actually going to last um, and, and things like that. You know, tables with these really tiny uh, tables that they looked okay when they're set up, but if the wind blew the wrong way, they, you know, they're falling apart. I mean, we go into clean and move them, you know, move them around. They would just, they would fall, you know, they, they had pieces that kind of snap together and they would just fall apart. And then they wound up. So what did you guys have to do? You, did you just like wait for them to break and then buy new things? Or did you like just see some of them or just like, I can't even have guests stay with this. Like I have to buy something new right now. Uh, yeah. So we, we wound up purchasing some, uh, some better quality, um, furniture so we basically spent you know double the price um and, and things like that and uh so we learned a lot from the first site um which is something that i would recommend is you know start with one site kind of perfect that and and then you know learn what works and what doesn't work uh, and then you can kind of duplicate that if you do want to set up a, a second site so just yeah just go from there figure out you know what what works and what doesn't work so after a full season, you probably had almost like 50 or 50 more guests stay at your glamp site, especially now that you guys um, have six sites coming up this year. So you're going to have a lot of people coming in and out. Um, but you said that you didn't always have the best person at all times. Uh, can you talk to us about some of like whether it be mistakes that you made with some of the people that stayed at your glamp site or some of the mistakes that, you know, or not even mistakes, but just, you know, dealing with a terrible, you know, it's not always a, a lovely person who respects your land, who stays at your glamp site. So can you talk to some of the hardships and, and battles that you had to face with that, with having guests stay at your land? Right. Yeah. So this, this will go back to my, my first guest ever. Um, I had listed on, uh, not Airbnb, but a different site. And my first guest, he booked, uh, like five days in a row and speaking to him more, I kind of realized what he was, he was trying to do. And it was like, solo camping trip um he wanted to be left alone he didn't want anybody to talk to him and um he wanted like a retreat uh, meditation retreat uh, in the middle of nowhere so you know just describing my the land it's it's set up like a uh it's like an open field the clear land and there there are other cottages that you can see there are people that are going to be driving by um you know everyone has their own space but you're going to expect to see other guests on the, on the property. Um, so, uh, I thought I had made it clear to him. Um, but when he arrived, he basically sent me a message and just said that, you know, sorry, but it's this is really, yeah. this is, really isn't what I'm looking for. Um, so, you know, one thing, this was like my first listing. It was still so new. And as the listing goes on and on and, and kind of grows, you can add, you add more pictures, uh, throughout different seasons you can show different angles um and that was that was one thing that i learned would be to take as many pictures from as many different angles as as you possibly can to make sure that they you know 100 percent know what they're walking into so that was you know the first um the first mistake that i made and it was kind of a, it was a negative experience luckily the guy understood and he found someplace else you know not okay so, so that something. didn't that didn't hurt you financially at least right you didn't have to pay well, him or well, yeah, so I had to refund the money. Uh, oh, okay. I had to refund, uh, you know, pretty much all the all the money. Uh, I, you know, I could have said, you know, well, there's, uh, there was no cancellation policy, but I, yeah, I felt, hey, listen, this is my mistake. This is the cost of business. Um, I'll give you a hundred percent, hundred percent back. Like, you know, I learned. Yeah. And then I updated some of the pictures and um, in the description, I, I I updated that to make guests uh, more aware. Just. Hey, you know, you're going to see other people. It's not going to be completely silent. It's, yeah. Uh, so if that's what you're looking for, unfortunately, this might not be the place. Uh, yeah. And that. did you have any other guest issues? Nothing, nothing like extreme, just um, some concerns about noise. Um, there was, 
there was one guest, uh, she said somebody was hammering it at five o'clock in the morning. She heard like somebody hammering on, on metal. It turns out there, there was a, there was these giant like woodpeckers up there that, <laughs> that found a metal shed on the property and was like pecking away at it. Uh, we didn't know what was going on, but we had to kind of figure that out. And, uh, mm-hmm. so, so just, just little complaints like that. Um, you know, being the property is upstate, there was, uh, we cleared out some, some bushes and we we're still doing a little bit of landscaping and there was like shotgun shells on, on the ground. So some, some guests weren't too happy about that, <laughs> uh, about that. So, so every, every time, you know, a guest would come up with a complaint, um, or a concern, you know, I would automatically kind of try to make it right. And I would try to, you know, I would refund them a little bit of money. Um, and then I would communicate with the landowner, Hey, you know, guests aren't really too happy with this. So let's, you know, maybe get somebody up there to rake or put down rocks or wood chips or something like that and, and just clean it up, make it look a little bit nicer. Cause these are some things that if I walked the property, I wouldn't really, uh, it wouldn't really bother me, but you mm-hmm. know, you have, you have, uh, mother and, and children stay in there. So it, it makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, like yeah. things like little, little things like that. Um, and, Knowing what you know now, right? Um, Because you've ran for a full season. You've had plenty of guests staying there. Um, Do you think there was anything or any mistakes that you made that, you know, would have been obvious to you now? Like, oh my goodness, like if you were restarting, like, of course I I shouldn't do that. Or, oh, I I need to make this like that. Like, did you place anything incorrectly, put anything in the wrong space or something? Just, uh, you know, just those little mistakes that beginners make that once you get a little bit more experience, you look back and you're like, oh, of course that wouldn't have worked. Um, Yeah. So one thing that comes to mind would be, you know, you can hear somebody talking from the other end of the property. So spacing these, the sites out a little bit more is something that I would have done and something that with one site didn't really make a difference um, because there's nobody else up there. But now with two or three or four other sites, um, you kind of want them to be spaced out uh, a little bit, a little bit more um, to cut down on some of the noise, and also kind of uh, not enforcing, but implementing maybe a quiet time where it's because uh, I didn't have any of these settings kind of checked on on the listing, you know. So maybe you know some people are up there just to spend the night because they have somewhere to go. Other people are up there to relax and enjoy kind of unwind and, and party so some of the people you know they're up all night drinking and having a good time which we're all for but then you know just kind of respecting other people's uh that just want to get you know they drove three or four hours and they want to get a decent nice rest uh you just talked about uh your listing now let's talk about that because um i'm not sure you know glamping is one thing airbnb is another so can you tell us anything that you learned or mistakes or just growing pains that you had with your listing and posting on airbnb airbnb you need to be available uh for your guests at at any time any hour um one thing that we had was the check-in time uh we kind of found that a lot of guests were they would you know they would be running late uh they would be out doing other things before they even came in. So we had some guests doing really, really late uh, check-ins, um, things like that, that, you know, typically the way we run the site, it's it's not self-check-in. We'll usually have the landowner, Mark, he'll, uh, he'll meet the guest and kind of show them around, show them, uh, you know, inside of the tent where the, where the bathhouse is, how to work the lights, how, how to, you know, where to park, everything like that. That's uh, that's one of the problems for for the listing is maybe setting a clear check in uh, check in time. As far as the, the listing, I can't really think of anything else. Just uh, okay. being being available at any moment. Uh, you know, I'm taking messages from from guests at, at peak season. It's just nonstop. It doesn't matter what. Uh, it could be in the middle of something or in the middle of the night. Speaking of Airbnb. I know when you first started, you were um, on Hip Camp, and you were like on every site that you possibly could have been on. Um, I wonder now, going into season two, are you still on multiple websites, or have you just consolidated to only posting your listing on Airbnb? Mostly consolidated to Airbnb. Um, I am open to putting it back on Hip Camp just to see what kind of traffic gets uh, gets brought in. It was on both, and primarily all the bookings came from Airbnb. So I kind of just focused. Um, I kind of just focused on on Airbnb. 
another thing is kind of coordinating the, the calendar. The, the biggest fear that I had was uh, double booking a site, you know, from, from these different hip camp and, and Airbnb, booking somebody for the same site and they both show up at the same time uh, for the same site. That's like the worst case scenario. That's, that's uh, something that I was kind of worried about. Now let's go back to just starting out. Um, if someone came up to you and was just like, hey, could you just tell me some really quick wisdom? You know, I only have a couple of minutes. Like, what are some of the biggest things that I need to know or prepare myself for to run a glamping business successfully? What would your answer be now that you are going to have six sites up, you've already ran for an entire season, things are going great, and you continue to invest more in your business? Uh, first thing I would say would be to start small, start, uh, with kind of low expectations. Um, you know, keep the price a little bit lower so you can kind of get your feet wet, get just, just focus on getting your first guests in there and making them happy and figuring out exactly what, what works and what doesn't, um, find somebody that you can trust. If you're not going to be on site, uh, find somebody that you can trust to actually, uh, will follow through and whether it's. Uh, a good reliable cleaner or it's somebody that you want to uh, do lawn maintenance or, or somebody that you want to do like a meet and greet um, to find somebody that you can trust uh, start with a basic setup you don't need to go too crazy uh, set up the site exactly the way that you would want it to be that if you were the guest uh, that's kind of the way I, I did it and um, you know just just focus on making the guests happy and there's there's gonna be it's not gonna be easy you have a lot to learn and um just start just just start right away you know okay cool so you started out with a tent would you recommend doing that too because you also now you have tents on your land and you also have cabins so if someone was just starting off would you tell them you should start with a tent would they jump straight to the cabin what what do you think is the one of the best structures to start off with um i would say depending on the land but Regardless, I would say start with a tent because that's probably the lowest uh, initial investment you can get one of these things going with. And you can make it absolutely beautiful. It doesn't need to be $10,000. Uh, you know, uh, it could be half that and you can get a, a decent site going. So I, I would say start with that. And based off that, you're going to learn who, you know, who your guests are, the type of people that are coming. And, um, kind of just keep your, your costs a little bit lower with, with, with a tent. I would highly recommend starting with, with a tent. And, you know, I wanted to start with a, a tiny home, which is very expensive. Um, I decided to start with a tent and I, I, I'm extremely happy with, with the tent setup. So happy that we're setting up. We'll have four of them and possibly more in the future. So I, I would, I would say um, for the investment and the return on your money, uh, I would, I would say start with a tent. Speaking of like purchasing, what is the most expensive thing you've bought for your glamping business? Um, just what's the most expensive thing you've bought? And also what's the most expensive thing that you bought that you regretted? The most expensive thing that I bought was, I mean, the most expensive piece was probably the tent itself. itself. Uh, again, going back to, you know, spending your money wisely and buying quality products. You don't want to buy the cheapest tent. You want to invest some money in something that's going to last. You want to try to get three or four years out of out of the tent you could buy them for you know 500 bucks but i would say expect to be changing that out every year just because of, of the low quality uh the last thing you want is for it to rain and start you know dripping on your guests while they're there they're not gonna have a good time i don't think i have anything that i regret spending money on the uh everything i think has a purpose don't think i wasted a lot of money i think that everything that i spent the money on um, was kind of, kind of well, well served. You know, I did, definitely learned what, you know, the, the quality to buy, but, uh, everything, you know, I have, uh, a regular queen size mattress, the, the tent, the tables, uh, Adirondack chairs and a couple of rugs. It, it, again, it's very basic, you know, so I could have spent, you know, thousands of dollars on a couch or fur rugs. Uh, but that's just mm -hmm. not something that <laughs> would kind of interest me for the style wise okay cool and what is the hardest part of running a glamping business that you 
didn't see coming? Like, like, did you, ex- or maybe you did expect it to be that hard, but just overall, what are some of the hard parts about running a glamping business? Um, well, as you grow, just the multiple, uh, kind of coordination with, with everything. There's, uh, there's a lot of moving parts. There's, um, you know, every time the guest comes, you need to, you know, constantly communicate with them. And when the guest leaves, um, that site needs to be turned over, especially if you're having a, another guest come the next day. You may only have an hour to actually get that site turned over and ready for the next guest. Um, so that that's probably one of the hardest parts is kind of coordinating with everybody. Uh, you know, it, it's not it's not as simple as just putting a, a tent in the middle of the woods or on some land. Uh, you know, the land needs to be taken care of. The strings on the tent need to be tightened. Um, you know, everything needs to be inspected to make sure it's not falling apart and nobody's going to get hurt. You know, the lawn needs to be mowed and, and you got to get the weed whacker and just trim up everything. Um, you got to make sure that the, the bathhouse is, you know, is fully operational. Um, you know, you have enough gas or propane or whatever's running the, to heat your water uh, or the, the little heaters that we have going in cold weather. There's just, uh, there's a lot of things going on uh, at the same time. And, and then mm-hmm. at the same time, if you're the only one handling the bookings, you're dealing with all that. And then you're also dealing with, you know, inquiries, new guests that, that want to book your, you're answering all those questions. And like me working a full-time job and doing all this stuff too. Um, and trying to have like personal life <laughs> after work, uh, you know, during peak season, don't plan on going away anywhere, you know, anywhere that doesn't have cell service, at least, you know, that's, uh, it, it's a big commitment. It's a big commitment. I'm, and I'm, I'm very happy doing it also. Cause uh, I, I love just allowing the guests to have a, a great place to stay and, and be happy. And we, we, we've successfully had that last year. The way that you set up your glamping business is you don't own the land. You've partnered with the land owner um, and you have kind of made a lot of the purchases and you set up your site. Um, and the, you also pay the landowner or, or, the, or you pay that team to help you with the cleaning and the ongoing uh, upkeep of it. Um, so that's kind of just at face value how your glamp site is run. Um, if you could restart and someone told you that you had to do something differently, what is the thing that you would change? Would you buy your own land? Would you set up a deal elsewhere? Would you, uh, you know, look for a different type of land? Like, like what would you do differently if you had to? Hmm, that's a very good question. It's a very good question. Um, I guess I would like to purchase land. I, I think that would be that would be pretty good. You kind of have to work with the way that the land is set up. If you're if you're able to purchase land ideally i would love to purchase the land and then develop ex- exactly the way that you know i would kind of imagine it to be um so I, I think that would probably be it when you lease land you kind of you you have what you have you you know it's not your property it's set up the way it is you have to make it work so you have to kind of work around different obstacles and different different people different um just a different a different setting. Whereas if, if you were to buy land, you can spend a year looking at a hundred different properties and you can pick the one that you know fits you best. Uh, so uh, I think I got pretty lucky because I'm very happy with, with the land that I'm leasing. And um, as you run your glamping business, what are some of your biggest fears? Like what are the things that kind of keep you up at night? Like what is, I don't want to, you know, dare I say worst case scenario, so to speak. I mean, like for me with my glamping business, um, I have a couple of fears, you know, I, one big fear is that someone at my glamp site who's just staying there kind of not even disrespects me or my land, but my neighbors. That would be my biggest fear. Someone like going onto my neighbor's land and like, I don't know, like getting drunk on his on his farm because my neighbors are, are farmers. Um, you know, I, I think that would be terrible. And then on top of that, I mean, absolutely my biggest fear is like just a giant fire, you know, like my A-frame is all wood. Um, so can you tell me some of your fears for your glamp site and, and things that could potentially go wrong? Um. Yeah, I mean, I would I would agree with both of those. You never want to uh, see a guest get hurt on your property, or or potentially get you know be responsible for something like that. Um, you know, the safety of, of the of the guests are probably uh, my biggest concern, biggest fear that something may happen. Uh, yeah, al- also the the neighbors you want um, that could kind of make or break you. If you know the neighbors are cool with it, 
when you told when, before you even set up the site, um, you kind of tell them, you know, it's all right, they're not going to bother you. But then, you know, the guests start bothering them and so they begin to get concerned. They could cause a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of headaches for you. Uh, you know, a lot of complaints could go to the town and, uh, you know, it could really make your life a nightmare if the neighbors really aren't mm-hmm. on board with what you're doing or if they have a bad experience with one of your guests. It only takes one to kind of kind of ruin that relationship. So yeah, that would that would definitely be it. Uh, again, going back to you know setting up the the bookings wrong and um, having two guests show up at the, at the site at the same time. Uh, I, w- I would say probably that would be my biggest fear. Yeah, that that is definitely one of my fears too. Um, and that's why I feel like I'm so lucky that, you know, I just have one, you know, uh, halo, like one one big site um, rather than having like multiple little ones because I would just be so nervous, like upkeeping and staying on, on top of everything. But so I would say my last question for you is uh, running your glamp site the way that you have, going, you know, last year you, uh, you know, were brand new to this. You learned about glamping and then six weeks later you had a glamp site and you just went for it. Um, I mean, I like to think that I kind of helped a bit because, oh, uh, yes. you, you, uh, <laughs> you, you were doing some coaching with me. Um, so I think that that was really smart that you would just like, just went for it straight and you were kind of like, all right, let me get some help and let's go straight for it. But that being said, you learn a lot as you do things. Um, so Based off of everything that you learned from last season, what are the things that you're going to be doing differently this season? Because I know that you're about to head up and set everything up for this coming season. Um, we're right about to head into busy season. So what are the things your glamp site is going to be doing differently? I know one major thing is you're going to have more sites. You're going from, I think, three to six. Right. But what else are you doing differently? Right. Um, uh, that's uh, another good question. Yes. So it's... Um basically everyone's kind of used to, we've been running the two sites and then at the end of the year, uh, we probably had three weeks where we opened up the, the, uh, the first tiny cabin. Um, so kind of everyone's familiar with, with their responsibility and what they have to do. So just kind of getting back into the swing of that, uh, times two, because we're going to have, you know, d- double the sites uh, as we did last year. Um, so differently, um, we are kind of developing the, the property and we're, we're um, building like an, uh, a new smaller kind of bathhouse. Uh, that, was, that was the first thing we did was build the bathhouse. Uh, it's got, you know, toilet, sink and shower. So we're um, the, where, where the, the new sites are going to be, they're a little bit further away. So we decided to actually build like a smaller bathhouse uh, so people don't have to walk that, walk that far in the middle of the night. We, we built uh, another tiny cabin. That's uh, that was another thing. That was another thing I had kind of written down was um, one cabin we bought and one cabin we built. So there was I, I kind of learned a lot from that. Um, so that's um, we'll probably be building more of our structures now instead of buying them. Um, that would be something that we kind of learned from last year. Was oh, that uh, was it just more cost effective and or you know like what what did you learn? Just the foundation, how having something delivered, there's added cost. Uh, you know the guy that's building it, he, you're paying him the highest like hourly labor to actually build it. That's all factored into the cost. Um, whereas if you purchase all the materials and you know we have a carpenter that that will work for us. We pay him probably half of what this guy was charging to actually build it off-site, and he can build it right on-site. So he builds it right on the foundation. You don't have to worry about kind of leveling out the, uh, getting it delivered, and then leveling out the the structure that's being delivered. Um, you can kind of just build the foundation, level the foundation, and then build the cabin on top of that. Yeah. Is there anything else that you guys are going to be doing differently this coming season? Um. Yeah. So one. One other thing, uh, last season we were kind of trying to keep the prices a little bit low. Uh, it, initially, uh, they were really low, just to kind of gain traction and gain interest and see how it was going to go. Um, slowly, towards the end of the season, we, we increased the prices a little bit more. Um, and then we're expecting a little bit more of an increase this year, um, just to get some added revenue and invest, reinvest that money back into the, into the site and all the future developments that we're having. One of the things that we learned is that, you know, the sites that are in direct sunlight, 
we they kind of get they get beat up by the sun if they're if they're doing direct sunlight uh, you know all day long all season so that you know the material starts getting faded a little bit so that that's one thing that we're, we're kind of investing in is like the rain flies and it's a basically a cover that goes on top of the the tents to protect it and kind of just um add a little bit more life and, and protection and keep it a little bit cooler on the inside of the, the tents uh, during the day and during the hot summer days. 